Good morning, church. My name is Chris Papafus. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. If you are visiting with us here this morning, I just want to extend a welcome to you. It is so good to have you here joining with us today. Uh, as many of you know, as many of you have been praying for this uh, past end of the week and yesterday, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday was our denomination's annual meeting. This is the highest authority uh, under Christ of our denomination, the Evangelical Covenant Church. And this, th there's always important business that is conducted at these meetings, but this year especially there were some very, very weighty and very heavy and very um, hotly debated conversations, uh, specifically as tied to um, two of our pastors and one of our congregations, First Covenant Church, uh, Minneapolis their senior pastor, Dan Collison, as well as a longtime covenant pastor, Steve Armfield. And uh, the charges that were brought against them and discussed at the ministerial level at the, for the pastors and at the annual meeting level for both the pastors and the, um, the church was whether they were uh, performing and conducting ministry within the covenant's um, commonly articulated understanding of human sexuality. And in all three of those cases, it was found those two pastors and the congregation itself were in fact out of harmony. And they were involuntarily removed uh, from the church, from the roster of covenant churches, which has never happened in our covenant history. Uh, and the pastors were involuntarily removed, uh, had their credentials stripped uh, from the evangelical uh, covenant church. This was a painful meeting. Very, very painful. Uh, the moderators at both the ministerial meeting and uh, Jonathan Wilson, who's pastor out at Salem uh, Covenant Church in rural Pennock, was the moderator for the annual meeting. They did a marvelous job, but you cannot minimize the pain. And it is wrong for us as a church to gloss over the pain that uh, our denomination is feeling today, uh, that specific congregations within our denomination is feeling, that individuals who have grown up in the Evangelical Covenant Church and who identify as LGBTQ, as, as lesbian or gay and bisexual, they feel that their church is uh, very much casting them aside and shoving them out and telling them that they have no value, no worth, and are uh, not loved by the church or by God. And that's not the intention of what we uh, the delegates, I believe, sought to communicate, but that, I believe, is how it, it can be received by many. And so I think it is appropriate as a church Regardless of how you feel about individually and how uh, you, you feel the, the, the vote went, and, and maybe you are angered by seeing how this is being picked up by the networks and you're feeling like it doesn't give an accurate picture of the Evangelical Covenant Church, and you're a little angry about that, I ask us to simply set all of that aside, to lift up in humble prayer, in a spirit of lament, what has transpired over this past weekend and pray God's guidance going forward. Let us pray together. Father God, we are an imperfect people seeking as best we can to honor you, a perfect and holy God. And God, that road is difficult. It is challenging. We desire to hold to what we find true, revealed in your holy word. And God, that so often runs contrary to what our culture says. And we struggle. God, we cannot help but read scripture through our own cultural lens. And so, Holy Spirit, we desperately need you to be present in our reading and in our hearing and in our listening. 
And so, Lord, we come before you today and we lament with our brothers and sisters around this country and Canada. We lament with our brothers and sisters in the Northwest Conference, our brothers and sisters at First Covenant Church, Minneapolis. We lament with the families and Dan Coll- of Dan Collison and Steve Armfield. We lift them up to you. We pray for them. May they have the resolve that in their anger they will not sin. May that same be true for us. Lord, would you make us an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us bring love. Where there is offense, let us bring pardon. Where there is discord, let us bring union. Where there is error, let us bring truth. Where there is doubt, let us bring faith. Where there is despair, let us bring hope. Where there is darkness, let us bring your light. Where there is sadness, let us bring joy. Oh, Master, let us not seek as much to be consoled as to console others. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that one receives. It is in self-forgetting that one finds. It is in pardoning that one is pardoned. And it is in dying that one is raised to eternal life. And so, Lord, we pray this in a spirit of lament. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our delegates to the annual meeting, Mike and Barb Buer and Diane and Jay Call, um, uh, Lawton, are on their way back from the annual meeting. It ended very late uh, last night with their series of uh, service of ordination for the incoming ordinance. Uh, they will be sharing uh, a report uh, next week, hopefully. Uh, I'll have them share. They were in the sessions directly. Uh, anything else you hear is all hearsay at this point. Um, Only the denomination and our delegates were allowed in those executive sessions and only they uh, can speak accurately to what actually transpired in those. So I want to hear directly from them. I was not in those executive sessions so I can't speak to that and I don't want to be giving any other um, indication or or any inadvertently give any false information. So I look forward to hearing from them uh, next week. We are in a current series uh, exploring two of the letters of the Apostle Paul. The letter to the church in Galatia, the letter to the church in Colossae. And Paul's teaching in the letter of Galatians is, is really specific. Paul is against practices performed by Christians that detract from the work of Christ. That neglect a conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit that creates unnecessary social boundaries between people and that threaten the purity of the gospel. So you, maybe along with me, as we look at our beloved denomination, have been reading through the letter of Galatians and wondering, does this really apply to us today and in what ways? We must be careful and read with our eyes wide open, listening to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Paul is adamant that the church refrain from adding anything to the gospel of Jesus which can lead us away from salvation by grace alone, through faith alone in Jesus. And when we add on to things, so often that becomes performancism or, or legalism or moralism. We, we tack on all of these things and then begin to say, if you truly want to be a follower of Jesus, then this is what you do. And in fact, it becomes necessary for salvation. He likewise speaks throughout the letter that we must not forget that the gospel, meaning good news, matters because we are living in the midst of bad news. To ignore our need to be saved from our sin creates a gospel-less religion of secularism and pluralism. We strip the good news right out of there and we say, what do I have to be saved from? 
Last week we heard Paul bear witness through his testimony of the authority that he alone has or that he shared authority that he has as an apostle. Authority given to him directly by Jesus. And we see in Paul's testimony a wonderful model for testimony in our own lives. This is how Paul says, this is who I was and this is how Jesus met me. And this is what Jesus has called me to do. This morning we turn to the text as Paul continues his argument and now tends to make it very, very personal as he starts, quite honestly, naming names, which none of us like to be part of those conversations when the accused stands up and they start naming names. But that's what Paul does in this passage. I invite you to turn with me to Galatians chapter 2, beginning with verse 11. The words will also be up on the screen. When Cephas, and Cephas is just uh, the Hebrew name for Peter, uh, Jesus kind of renamed him and and in the the translations we regard him as Peter, Petros, the rock, but, but he was Cephas. And when Cephas came to Antioch, this is Paul speaking here, I opposed him to his face. Because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Right away, we see introduced in the, not only this letter into the, to the church in, in Galatia, but also as we see the church growing in the book of Acts, we see that the church did not always see eye to eye. Amen? I don't know if we should say amen to that or not, but it's true. The church does not always see things eye to eye because the church is comprised of imperfect people and we are all seeking to listen to the Holy Spirit who dwells within us and we sometimes hear things wrong. Sometimes I believe that the Holy Spirit wants us to work through these challenges so that we can come to a deeper understanding of God's profound and deep love for us and God's work in the world. And sometimes if we just all sit in in constant agreement and say, well, whatever Pastor Chris says, that's good enough for me, we don't delve into the depths of understanding what the Holy Spirit is doing in our midst. And so I believe that even in conflict, we are not to betray unity within that, but within conflict, I believe that God desires for us in working through that to glorify God. And so the church entered into conflict. Not once, not twice. We have 2,000 years of history of church conflict. And it is messy. There is no fight like a church fight. Right? No fight like a church fight. I remember walking into my first meeting in the church, in First Covenant Church in Omaha. And the reason that I was sent to Omaha was to help that church who had gone through very, very difficult staffing situation. And, and the question was legitimately being asked by that congregation, are we going to survive this or not? And so I was asked to go in as a staff person there and serve on a transitional team. And I remember my first congregational meeting there. I'd only been there maybe a couple of days, I think, by that point. And I showed up and they started fighting with one another and voices were being raised and people were being called out. And I got up to then share and introduce myself after all that had been going on. And I told them, I said, you know, I I feel a little bit like I'm going to pick up my date and walking in on a family fight. That's what it felt like. But you know what? They stuck together. Those that were in that room that evening 
They were all there when I left three years later, standing in a very different place, their eyes fixed on Jesus, ready to move on and follow him. God had done a remarkable work in their lives, but they stuck with it. They stuck in the fight to listen. And they loved each other well in the midst of it. The church disagreed. In this passage of scripture that we have this morning, we see Paul on one side, and, and Paul really represents a, a, a very progressive view of the Christian movement. And on the other side, we have James, the brother of Jesus. And he was very much in favor of kind of the, the Judaizing of the Christian church. He recognized that, that he was Jewish, his brother was Jewish, and that this, this movement of following Jesus came out of Judaism, and therefore the Gentiles, he felt, must take on the law of Moses and in essence become Jewish before they could really become authentic followers of Jesus. And we got to feel a little bit for our brother Peter here, because Peter is very much in the middle. He is a moderate. He's stuck between these two apostles who are at odds with each other. And Peter knows that, well, he can't really move closer to Paul without James getting upset with him. And he can't really move closer to James without Paul getting upset with him. Peter's stuck in the middle. And this, of course, is Paul's account. We don't have James' point of view from this, but this is Paul's account. And eventually, Peter would move closer to Paul's stance. In fact, the, the Jerusalem council would alter the trajectory of the church permanently by putting forth this is what the expectation is for our Gentile brethren and sisters. I believe in this passage that Paul is growing out of and off of the shared testimony that he and Peter had. And in Paul's testimony, Paul's conversion to Jesus was immediate. He came out of, of his conversion experience aware of his sinfulness, amazed by God's gracious forgiveness, and assigned by Jesus a mission to reach the Gentiles. All of this happened to Paul in Acts chapter 9 in the spaces between verse 1 and verse 30. In just a matter of, of mere days, Paul's conversion seemed to completely disrupt his life and set him on a completely different trajectory. That was Paul's testimony. But Peter's testimony, his journey in faith, took years. It was long and it was bumpy. Peter's journey began in Jerusalem. It was established in Galilee. He was the first to confess Jesus' messiahship. He floundered in the Passion Week, was revived after the resurrection, came to maturity at Pentecost, and then continues to stumble and get up again and again throughout the book of Acts. Paul assumes that he and Peter had the same saving faith in Jesus Christ, even though their conversion experiences were radically different. Paul begins with that. He reminds Peter, don't forget your journey in faith. Paul then draws from this to make his argument against those who would add anything to the gospel of Jesus Christ in order to somehow make it more saving, more good news-ish. Paul wants to restrict that. He does not want to go in the direction of legalism, moralism, performancism. And so he goes on in verse 15 to say this. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles. I believe he's, he's this I don't think is the actual dialogue that, that took place between he and Peter. But I think this is Paul's summary of what happened with it. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we, too, have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Well, absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, 
then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Paul lays out his key argument. A person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So there's a couple of, of terms that I think we need to address in understanding this. Justification, works, and faith. Justification, to be justified, it's, it's really our acceptance with God. That's what justification means. And, and this is a legal term. If we are guilty of sin, which we are, and God is holy, set apart from sin, which God is, then we have a huge problem. God is judge, and we cannot approach the mercy seat of this judge on account of our own sinfulness. Paul also uses righteousness or being in right relationship throughout this letter. See, Jews were given the law to point out their sin and outline the mediating measures to regain that right relationship. They had both the knowledge of their sin and the restorative means to justification, the way to get back into acceptance with God. I don't believe that, that any of the, the prevailing Jewish thought, especially at the time of, of Jesus, would have said that somehow they can earn God's favor. They knew that God was holy, that there was no way they could earn God's favor. God had given God's favor to them by setting them apart. But God also gave them the law so that they might recognize and know their own sinfulness as well as providing for them a means of atonement for that sin. And so when they talk about the sins of the Gentiles, they were really saying that we're not Gentiles because we have the law and we know when we sin and we have the means, we have, we, we have explained it to us how we can be atoned, how we can be brought back into acceptance with God. The Gentiles don't have any of that. So in essence, they're doubly cursed. They don't even have the law to follow. But we have the law and we can and should and what those Judaizers were arguing, we must follow the law of Moses. Gentiles were doubly cursed. And so that's that connection. And, and Paul is saying to Peter, you know, you behave like a Gentile. You don't follow the whole of the Mosaic law because you've experienced, you've found this freedom in Jesus Christ. You're living by faith now in Jesus Christ. So why would you tack back on the law to try to somehow improve this good news? The key question for Paul, the heart of the good news is, what justifies? Are we justified by works? And he says, quite pointly, it's not by the works of the law. Now, throughout Paul's writing, he really speaks of works in three different ways. First is what I'll describe as the principle of works. And this Paul speaks against in Romans chapter 3. And it is the idea of doing works in order to earn acceptance with God. Okay, and I think Paul speaks to this specifically in Romans because this is a very uh, uh, Greek, Gentile, I would even say it's a very Western uh, approach to religion. What can I do in, in order to somehow earn favor with the deity to which I'm, I'm looking to worship? What works must I do? Again, this was not... That wasn't anything that was being perpetuated within the Jewish community. So when Paul is writing to the Romans, he's writing to these Gentile believers who have come in and said, how do I gain acceptance with God? What must I do in this principle of works? Works. 
And so in this, we kind of have this ongoing ledger of works. What must I do? Do my good works outweigh my bad works? Maybe we have neighbors or friends who this is their understanding of being a follower of Jesus. I take stock of my life. I'm basically a good person. My good works outweigh my bad works. I help more old ladies cross the street than I run them over with my car. Therefore, why would God ever condemn me? Right? The second works that Paul speaks of are the works of the law and, and that acceptance with God can only be achieved by following the law of Moses. So it's not just about good works, doing good things broadly. It's specific to following the law of Moses. So you would help old women, old ladies cross the street because within the law of Moses it says you must do this three times a day. And if you don't, then you are sinning. It doesn't really say that in the, in the law of Moses. And I'm not advocating that we shouldn't help uh, anybody cross the street. We should all be helping one another cross the street. That's not, that's not what I'm, I'm pointing at. Uh, another one is good works. Number three, good works called out. This is called out of God's grace to serve other people with actions that are befitting to new life. A life that is justified. A lifestyle that is moral and godly. This gets to how Paul feels Christians should live. This is the result or the outpouring work of new life in Christ. Dependent on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Paul picks up on Jesus' terminology of fruits. And he speaks of this not only here in Galatians but also in Ephesians chapter 2. So this is the sense of there are good works that flow out of your faith. And Paul is in favor of those. In Galatians, Paul is specifically addressing works of the law. And he tells Peter, he asks him right out, he's saying to Peter, Peter, we are Jews. We are Jewish Jesus followers. We are Jesus followers who are Jewish. And we know that we are not saved by keeping or doing the works of the law. The Gentiles are, are sinners. We join them as sinners, separate from the law. Now, this doesn't mean that Jesus promotes sin. Rather, Jesus promotes faith and faith rightly placed in him alone. So, he would go on to say, if Jesus tore down the structure of justification, the law of Moses, why would we build it up again? We would be doubly cursed but rather, we would be doubly lawbreakers to tear down that, to, to, to see what Christ has torn down, only to be rebuild it again in order to keep it. And in essence, build a barrier to keep us from the grace of God. You're insisting on the law, he argues, that doesn't and never did save us. Essential for salvation for those whom God has already saved through Jesus Christ including us, is faith. Jesus tore down the law. Why are you rebuilding it? He asks Peter. So if we are not justified through works, but rather through faith, specifically faith in Jesus Christ, and the necessary response of living at peace with God is faith. Often we wonder, what, what, what is faith? How do I describe that? Is, is it an intellectual assent? Is it something that I, I believe in? Is faith something that a little bit deeper that I put my trust in? The answer is yes and yes. It's what we believe intellectually. It's also what we put our trust in, our hope in. Not only for today, but for tomorrow and for life eternal. It is the necessary response of living at peace with God. It is the initial and continual response of trust in and obedience to Christ by a person for the purpose of acceptance with God. Now this might start to rub some of you the wrong way. Some of you might be thinking, wait a minute. I didn't know that how I lived actually impacted my acceptance with God. I, I thought that was the whole point of this thing, that I'm not saved by works, but I'm saved 
by the grace of God? And Paul would say, yes. In faith, in Jesus Christ. And faith is not a one and done activity. Hear me on this, church. Faith is not a one and done activity. Faith is a renewing of this covenant, this renewing of, of, of this acceptance from God every single day. People ask me, have you ever recommitted your life to Jesus Christ? I tell them, I recommit my life to Jesus Christ every morning and multiple times throughout the day. It's faith. It's faith. That is what Paul is getting at. Faith is complete trust and complete surrender to Jesus Christ. It is the total acceptance of all that Jesus said, all that he offered, and all that he is from the great theologian William Barclay. That is faith. That is faith. When we simply say faith is, is, is an intellectual exercise, then I can decide, well, this is what I believe and I never have to revisit it again. I can just stop, pile that back in my mind and say I'm good. This is what I believe. But there's trust involved with this. This daily walking in faith that reflects our acceptance from a living God. We are saved by grace. And this, Martin Luther and the Apostle Paul agree completely. We are saved by grace. And I'll throw my hat in the ring too. <laughs> not that, I, you know, I'm not Martin Luther. <laughs> by any means. We are saved by the grace of God. By faith in Jesus Christ. But that faith is not just a one and done. That faith is an ongoing, daily walking with Jesus. Paul is pleading with Peter, remember your conversion. It wasn't your adherence to the law of Moses that saved you. It was Jesus Christ who saved you. Remember, Peter, that walk on the beach. Three times Jesus asked you if you, if you loved him. And you were called into ministry, not because you performed the works of the law, but because Jesus won for you a faith that requires a continual response of trust and obedience in Jesus. Remember Pentecost, Peter, when the Holy Spirit fell upon you, not because you were an expert in the law, but because you put your trust in Jesus and waited for the counselor, the advocate, to show up and fulfill Jesus' promise. Remember, Peter, you weren't saved by the works. You were saved by faith. And in each of these expressions of your own life, Peter, it was your faith that brought acceptance, that brought justification because of the grace of God, not in your ability to keep the law. For the Jews growing up, and I get this, this is hard. For the Jews growing up, seeing the law as the center of God's revelation, it is no small matter to turn away from the law as the means of acceptance by God. And for the Jews who sat idly by and watched other Jews turn to Christ, I think there was fear that leaving the law meant abandoning God's moral will. And so too, perhaps we in the church find ourselves in a similar situation. By seeking to live in a place where we don't add on to the gospel, becoming legalistic, moralistic or inadvertently turning faith into a performance to gain acceptance with God. Or we think of Jesus, faith in Jesus as, as merely a religious aspect of our already compartmentalized lives. We really are embracing pluralism and secularism and stripping the gospel of its good news for new life. You see, if both of these extremes are wrong, we're invited to cling to the middle. And it's understandable that as we cling to the middle, we find ourselves faithless. Forgetting that faith in Jesus is a daily action, not a one and done commitment. Scott McKnight says this, those who have been justified live justly. Those who have experienced God's love, love 
others. Those who have experienced God's forgiveness, forgive others. Those who have been called from the world no longer live in the world and call others to be out of the world with them. Those who have died to the flesh live in the Spirit. We are justified by faith, transformed by grace, and now live unto God. This is what Paul is reminding Peter. This is what Paul is reminding each and every one of us when we feel drawn to either extreme. We are saved by the grace of God. In faith, through faith, expressed every single day. In the work of evangelism, too often I fear that we simply invite people to say a prayer and be saved. We're inviting them, in essence, to add a little Jesus into their term life policy. Something happens, then they'll be covered. I'm here to tell you this morning that being justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ is a guarantee to mess up your life. Faith in Jesus Christ will mess up your life. And I confess as one who has proclaimed the gospel for 20 plus years in churches that I have not stressed that enough. Do I want people to have an eternity with Jesus? Absolutely. But I've not done the work of saying by turning to Christ and living in faith, it's going to mess up your life. And that is the painful truth revealed throughout the entire New Testament. People's lives were messed up by the good news of Jesus. And they went to their deaths proclaiming with smiles on their faces that they were children of God. We don't add anything to the gospel of Jesus and we don't ignore our need to be saved. All of this is possible because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst. And we're going to get talking about him later on. But right now, let's pray. Father God, we come before you this day lifting up to you all praise, all glory, and all honor. We stand amazed at your grace. If we would only turn our eyes upon ourselves to see our own sinfulness, our own depravity, our own fear and anxiety, our own emptiness and loneliness, if we just take stock for the briefest of moments, we then are all the more amazed by your grace that you would look upon us as we are and love us. We adore you because you first adore us. God, we confess that perhaps we have made following you a one-and-done intellectual activity instead of a day-to-day -day activity of faithful obedience. Holy Spirit, would you gently if gentle as possible and would you ruthlessly if that's what re is required bring us to a place of repentance and a willingness to turn to you and to be stepping out in faithful obedience God we come before you today as a thankful people a people that especially as we move into this week and we celebrate a nation that is not perfect by any means but we call it home and we thank you God for those who have gone before us to give us particularly a freedom to worship you and so we thank you God we thank you for this nation and we pray Lord for her we pray for our leaders may we not take for granted what we have as followers of Jesus in this great country. God, we come before you and we lift up our concerns. 
We lift up to you the frontier kids who are going to be heading off to Lake Beauty Bible Camp tomorrow. Some for the very first time, their first overnight, maybe even away from home. We lift them up to you. We pray that you would encounter them there, that they would meet you, and that they would fall in love with you. God, I lift up to you those in our midst facing illness, brokenness in their bodies, in their emotions, and in, maybe in their, their mental health. I lift them up to you. For those struggling against addiction, I pray for them. May their identity be found in you and not in things that simply try to take away the pain. God, I lift up to you the guests that we had staying here this past week with Family Promise. God, would you work a mighty work in their lives, be their provision. I pray that as they um, interact with you and, and stay in churches throughout our community, that they would experience your deep, deep love for them. And so, God, we come as your people. We thank you for the opportunity to have worshipped. We thank you for the gift of your word, and we will go as your people. Lead us. Invite us into faith, we pray. In your precious and holy name, amen and amen.